And a big thanks to everybody for uh, getting your names on your screen. And I've got 12 o'clock on the dot. So we're going to go ahead and get rolling. I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to the Telemedicine Echo, hosted by Show Me Echo in partnership with Heartland Telehealth Resource Center. And I'm Joe Kingsbury. My title here at NTN is Echo Hub Recruiter. But for the next couple of months, at least, uh, I will be helping to support this Echo in the coordination role just for a little bit until we get somebody drained up to take the reins permanently. So uh, I'm happy to be with you and I'd like to go ahead and pass the torch to uh, your facilitator, Molly Brown. Molly. Thank you, Joe. Yes, welcome everybody. Sorry, my computer. Welcome to the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center, Oklahoma State University Center for Health Sciences and Missouri Telehealth Network Telemedicine Echo. As Joe said, my name is Molly Brown. I am the director of the HTRC and I have the pr privilege to moderate the session today. I would like to ask everyone on the Echo to rename your Echo screen name if you haven't already. You can right click on the, or click on the three dots in the upper right corner of your picture and you can click rename. If you are calling in, please let us know who you are in the, uh, and we can uh, document it. I would like to introduce the hub team members and I will do a quick shout out for each one to uh, introduce themselves. Again, my name is Molly and I'm with the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center. Rachel. Hi everybody, I'm so excited to be uh, with you today and we're kicking off this ECHO again for this year. I'm Rachel Mutra, the Director of the Missouri Telehealth Network and Show Me ECHO program. Thank you, Karen. Hi everybody, Karen Edison, Senior Medical Director for the Missouri Telehealth Network and our Show Me ECHO program. Thank you, Karen. Um, do I see, I'm, I'm there, Evelyn? Good afternoon, great to see everybody. I'm Evelyn Nelson, I'm the PI for the Heartland Health Resource Center. And Tim. Good morning, uh, actually, we used to do morning, it's afternoon now, I guess, sorry about that. Uh, Tim Davis, uh, telehealth manager at OSU Center for Health Sciences and work with HCRC in Oklahoma. Thank you. Was there anyone um, else listed that I didn't mention? I don't think so. A couple of announcements to make before we get started. For a more collegial environment, we will use first names only during our uh, discussions later on in the presentation. Please be conscious of confidential and protected health information as it arises. Raise your hand if you would like to speak or you can also use the chat. Please keep your microphones on mute until you're ready to speak. Please say your name prior to speaking so that we can be on that more informal basis. The presentation it will be available on SharePoint. Um, as, a, as a participant, you should have access to that. And our team will, will be putting case recommendations in SharePoint for everyone to access as we move through the program for the next 10 months. So to get started, Building off our Telemedicine Echo program that wrapped up in July, we are launching our 10-month Keeping Momentum Echo series to build and expand telehealth programs in the tri-state area and beyond. If you are new to the Telemedicine Echo series, pre previous Echoes are available on the HTRC YouTube channel, and I will be dropping the link in the chat shortly. To kick off the 2022-2023 program, I would like to introduce our didactic presenter, Rochelle Martin. Rochelle is an attorney licensed in Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska, and is an outreach and education partner with the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center, serving Kansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma. Rochelle is a registered health information, information administrator and certified coder who focuses on healthcare coding, billing, and reimbursement. She has practical experience with coding and billing issues, having worked in-house in healthcare administrative roles. She has served as an outpatient multi-specialty surgery coder, hospital-based outpatient coder, and a compliance coordinator for a large multi-specialty medical group. In addition, she has extensive HIPAA privacy and security and health information management experience. It is important to note that this presentation serves as education and information purposes only and should not be taken as legal advice. Rochelle will also be our case presenter. So Rochelle, take it away. 
All right. Thanks, Molly. So one more mic check. Make sure you can hear me okay before we get started and that you can see the slides okay. All is perfect. Well. Perfect. Okay. Well, I always like to start um, any session that I do, particularly in telehealth where things are changing um, very rapidly with um, any late breaking news that we have in terms of policies or legislation or announcements with respect to telehealth. And, you know, it's funny, we have no shortage of those. It seems like almost every presentation has something that we can talk about. So the uh, late breaking news that's only a few days old um, as of today is that the um, the federal public health emergency through uh, the, the Federal health, uh, Department of Health and Human Services for COVID-19, the PHE that we've been operating under since, um, I guess it was March, but retroactive to January of 2020, uh, but which created the ability for um, the agency, CMS and Department of Health and Human Services to create a lot of telehealth flexibilities outside of what's ordinarily their statutory restrictions under the Social Security Act. Um, was renewed. So uh, October 13th was the date of renewal. We anticipated it probably would be renewed, but um, each 90-day renewal period that comes up, the announcement to renew seems to come later and later. They had been announcing it a week ahead of time, and the last two or three, they announced it in the afternoon, the day of the date of expiration, and that's what happened here. So with that, there are several important dates that I want you to keep in mind. Um, the, so the previous period ended, or would have ended, excuse me, October 13th. It was renewed, and it always goes in 90-day increments. So the period that we are in right now would extend an additional 90 days through January 11th, 2023. With that extension, there are several other important dates. Um, one of them is November 12th, next month. And the significance of mid-November is that last year, the Federal Department of Health and Human Services um, sent a letter out to the governors of each state um, committing to giving advance notice before they would allow, uh, the, the, the feds would allow the federal PHE to expire. So if we're looking at a January um, end to the current 90-day period, 60 days prior to that's going to be mid-November. So here in a few weeks, um, you know, we may have an announcement that everybody needs to start preparing for the end of the PHE. If we get into December and we don't have that, that might be a signal that we've got an additional 90 days potentially after that. The other significant date with the PHE being extended for an additional 90 days comes from um, a law that was passed earlier this year in March. It was called the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2022. That's a mouthful. You don't need to remember the act. But what is important in that act, which was a budget bill, is that it extended um, many, but not all, of the telehealth flexibilities that we have available to us during the PHE by statute to go on for 151 days after the PHE ends. So with a January, at least January 11th, 2023 um, PHE date, that gives us at least until January 11th, 2023, when many of those flexibilities will continue. So um, stay tuned. There's actually another bill that I'll talk about um, that might impact that end date for some of the flexibilities as well. Uh, well, here it is. I thought it was going to be at the end. I've got it right here at the front. That um, that kind of third piece um, um, that it has an important date to it is a federal piece of federal legislation that I want to emphasize has not passed and become law yet, but it has passed the House. It's waiting to be heard and potentially passed by the Senate. What I understand is that it's it's possible, maybe even likely, that it's going to kind of sit there and hang out until maybe midterm elections next month and then might be heard and passed after that time uh, by the Senate. But if it does, this bill that has passed the House that's bipartisan, that doesn't seem to be hugely controversial, would take many of those same flexibilities that right now are guaranteed to extend through June of 2023 and would actually extend them out further through December 31st of 2024. And again, this is not final yet. 
The only thing that's final right now is that some of those flexibilities will go for 151 days after the PHE ends. So the thought um, with this, this potential piece of legislation, if it passes the Senate, um, is that that would give Congress time to think about all of the flexibilities that we've had kind of rolled out as part of the public health emergency and which ones um, of those we could potentially make permanent and codify into the Social Security Act. Um, if you're like me, I always like to listen to kind of the, the intent and the policy behind some of these things. So I've got a link here when the slides go out where you can listen to the House um, Rules Committee meeting to discuss this bill and kind of listen to their logic and their thought processes and their hesitation for just making these changes permanent to begin with versus an extension like what ended up passing um, uh, passing the House. All right. so. Um, moving on to the content for today's session, um, I want to talk about um, kind of some, some COVID concepts that were, I call it the pre-COVID era. This is like a whole era in my, my time frame now. What the normal rules for telehealth services, coding, billing restrictions were before a lot of these flexibilities came about. And then I want to take a look at what flexibilities were created um, as a result of the federal public health emergency. And I think it's important to keep in mind that most of these flexibilities are coming about from agency decision that, but for the public health emergency, the agency doesn't have the authority to make these rules permanent. That's why we literally need an act of Congress to make some of these changes permanent. Um, and we'll take a look at that. So once we look at what the normal rules are, what the flexibilities are, then that's where I want to do our case study for today to take a look at how one behavioral health provider really transformed their model of care to adopt the flexibilities of telehealth to make their services um, more accessible, improve quality, and really take advantage of some of the, the um, virtual and telehealth care options that are out there. And then as we kind of segue from that, I want to take a look moving forward on what telehealth looks like as the public health emergency and telehealth policy uh, kind of extends into the future, because I think it's it's clear that telehealth is here to stay, but how and to what extent and how long we have to wait for some changes to become permanent is what we want to take a look at. All right, so let's jump into some of the pre COVID era rules, requirements, and restrictions for telehealth services. And so what this is referring to, if, if we took COVID out of the picture, if we took flexibilities out of the picture, this is what would remain in terms of the rules and the guidelines under the Social Security Act, the law pass, passed by Congress. These were the rules that we had to kind of follow and some of the restrictions that we were under before COVID kind of propelled telehealth into the, the forefront of healthcare delivery. Some of the most significant drawbacks from the, the regular telehealth rules, as many of you know, um, are restrictions on the site of service where the patient could had to physically be located when that telehealth service is being um, delivered. Restrictions on the type of supervision that had to be provided by the rendering provider over whomever is delivering the telehealth services. Restrictions on the providers performing, um, uh, who can perform as a distant site telehealth provider. We have geographic restrictions. So restrictions, restrictions, restrictions is kind of the key theme there. Geographically, Prior to COVID and some of the flexibilities, telehealth could only be delivered to a patient if the patient was in a, a rural geographic area and or a healthcare provider shortage area. And a lot of those, those two concepts um, overlap significantly. There's a whole statutory and a kind of a complicated formula on what it means to be in a, um, a rural geographic area. It's a county 
that's outside of metropolitan statistical areas. Um, HRSA, actually, if you go to the HRSA.gov website, they have a great map that shows you metropolitan statistical areas, and you can see counties that fall outside of that, that would be considered rural geographic areas for telehealth purposes. Um, or healthcare provider shortage areas, HRSA also has a map of those. So just geographically, the patient had to be in one of those two types of, of geographic locations. But in addition to that, the place where the patient actually received the telehealth service, you'll call that's called the originating site, could only be certain settings and generally with, with very, very limited exception had to be a type of healthcare uh, facility or location. So a physician practice, um, a critical access hospital, a rural health clinic, an FQHC, um, a regular hospital uh, that's not critical access, skilled nursing facilities, community health centers, uh, community mental health centers, and, and several others. But with very, very limited exception, the patient could not be at home or at another location when the telehealth service was provided. And that was a significant limitation. And then on the other end of the spectrum, those are, that's the originating site where the patient's located. We had more restrictions on the types of professionals at the distance site that are, are doing the telehealth service or visit um, who could render that service. And again, I guess I should emphasize as I'm as I'm saying this, these are Medicare's rules. So outside of Medicare and state programs might have slightly different requirements. Um, but from a, a Medicare policy perspective, physicians could be distant site providers um, and certain practitioners, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, but you're gonna see some, some very important types of disciplines that are not included on this list. Physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy are not on this list. Rural health clinics, FQHCs, and critical access hospitals as distant site providers are not on this list. So those were some significant limitations even in rural geographic areas. The type of communication technology, for the most part, with very, very limited exception, had to be um, real time, so live, two way, audio, and visual. So, for the most part, prior to COVID, audio only communications were not covered as telehealth services. There had to be a visual component. And so I think part of the rationale for requiring the patient present to a healthcare facility in a rural geographic area is the idea that maybe outside of those healthcare settings, there may not be sufficient bandwidth to facilitate that, that video component of the service. So this is my attempt to illustrate that during the PHE, we're trying to kind of fix and repair some of those restrictions so that um, telehealth services were more accessible for a lot of reasons. Of course, at the beginning of the PHE, um, there was a strong desire to re reduce any kind of in-person, face-to-face contact and potential exposure to COVID-19 um, that was not necessary. And so we made available um, telehealth services in different ways that we've never had accessible through the Medicare program before. And we're essentially trying to take some of those, those restrictions and those limitations and open them up um, within reason while we continue to provide quality and safe patient care services in a totally different format than we have been used to. So some of those changes um, that opened up during the public health emergency were adding the patient's home as an eligible originating site. Huge, uh, huge flexibility. Whether we were within or outside of a rural geographic area, the patient from um, the com comfort, safety, privacy, and convenience of their own home could now access a telehealth service, um, eliminating the need to present to you know, a clinic or a hospital where there may, they may increase the risk of exposure. Another huge one to, to open up the door um, to access these services during the PHE was an elimination or sort of a waiver of the rural geographic area requirements. So in, in cities and communities, it may have even been more important during the beginning of the, the outbreak um, that folks in 
uh, metropolitan and urban areas did not have to go on site to a healthcare facility where there was a greater chance of potential exposure to the virus. Anyone, um, anywhere, uh, as long as all other requirements are met, could have access to telehealth services under Medicare. Um, considerably broadening the scope. So one of the restrictions I guess I should have added to my list is um, there is a list of CPT codes that can be provided as covered telehealth services under the Medicare program. And that list went from about this long, this is my very scientific measurement of it, to um, several pages uh, of an Excel spreadsheet with um, CPT codes that began to be covered as, as telehealth services during the PHE. Um, so we considerably expanded that list on a sort of temporary flexibility basis. And then we also expanded who can provide as the distant site provider those telehealth services. Um, RHCs and FQHCs were added as eligible distant site providers. Um, so that's been a huge um, uh, plus for those types of locations that previously could only be the facilitator of a telehealth service where the patient presents and a distant site provider um, renders telehealth. Now they could reach their patients at home and that could be an RHC visit or an FQHC visit um, uh, because they were eligible to bill as distant site providers. I wanna add one, um, highlight one piece there. In the Consolidated Appropriations Act that was passed in March, it was the law that extends a lot of telehealth flexibilities, including this one about distant site providers, for 151 days after the public health emergency ends. It includes um, extending the ability to, for patients at home or any other location, not just home, it could be a retail clinic or a parking lot at the grocery store, to access telehealth services for 151 days after the PHE ends. And it also would continue to allow RHCs and FQHCs to continue to bill as distant site telehealth providers through that June of 2023, or that's kind of a dot, 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 because if it extends again, that, that time period will continue to um, uh, extend out an additional 90 days. But what it did not do is capture critical access hospitals. So they, um, as of right now, the day that the public health emergency ends, critical access hospitals would no longer be able to bill as distant site telehealth providers. Where I have found that comes into effect uh, most often are critical access hospitals providing some of their outpatient therapy type services to patients at home, billing as the distant site provider, and that flexibility would no longer be available at, at the end of the PHE. It also, some of our flexibilities would allow those, those three disciplines that I highlighted, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy, as well as any other provider who is enrolled under the Medicare program and who can bill for their, tele, bill for their professional services um, can right now uh, bill as distant site telehealth providers. So it's significantly increased um, options and, and flexibility in that way as well. Certain services, not all of the CPT codes on that telehealth list, but certain ones can be delivered in an audio only format. And if you're curious which ones are eligible, if you go to cms.gov, I can almost walk you through this um, decision path by, by memory by now, but in the top uh, left-hand corner, there's a link for Medicare. Scroll to the very bottom of that site, you'll see a link for physicians. And then there's a regulation uh, notice section that you can go to. That's the physician uh, Medicare physician fee schedule proposed rule and final rule. And in those links, you will see an Excel spreadsheet attachment that you can open and download. And it shows you all of the CPT codes that are currently el eligible to be provided by telehealth, which ones are eligible for audio only also. And important to some discussion in just a bit, it will also show you which ones will go away the day that the PHE ends versus which ones will continue to be available for 151 days after the PHE ends. Um, during the PHE, we also had a reduction in provider supervision requirements. So what I mean by that, uh, by provider supervision, is that if the, let's, uh, in the model of a physician who is supervising uh, maybe a registered nurse, and in the in-person 
clinic setting, if a patient come, came in to visit with the nurse for a blood pressure check, something that didn't necessarily require the physician to actually be in the room during that visit, that could still be reported as a you know, quote unquote nurse visit, like a 99211 under the name and number of the physician if certain incident to and supervision requirements are met. That supervision requirement is called direct supervision. And typically, direct supervision means that the physician is physically in the office suite where that registered nurse is providing the service and is immediately available to intervene if needed. That concept didn't really work well with telehealth and with the PHE because doctor may be at home quarantining, um, but could intervene during a telehealth service by simply clicking on a link and joining the session to be immediately available if needed. Or the nurse may be at home um, at quarantining or for whatever reason, but still healthy enough to help patients. And a uh, doctor and nurse may not be physically in the same office suite. So something called virtual presence was created during the PHE saying that for a telehealth service, the direct supervision requirement that allows us to bill for that service under the physician's name um, could be satisfied by virtual presence, meaning the physician or the other healthcare provider is available to join that session um, as needed and to provide assistance. Thank you, Rochelle. We did have one question in the chat that maybe we can go ahead and address prior to moving to the case study. Sure. This, this was a question regarding services across state lines, patient being in one area and the specialist is only found many hours away out of state. Um, should those patients be able to be seen via telehealth? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, and it's probably one of the more common ones that we get about some of the telehealth flexibilities. Um, I always feel like I have to kind of back up and give the historical context to this. So pre-COVID flexibilities, um, provider licensure and whether we can see patients in another state is based on state law. And so the state, uh, the state law and the licensing board of each state determines when it require when you can practice medicine or other healthcare disciplines in that state. Um, a lot of states even have laws about telemedicine and that when a telemedicine service is being provided, that the provider needs to be licensed in the state where the patient is located. So that's kind of our general or our, our default rules. Then when COVID came about, one of the first flexibilities that Medicare issued was a payment rule, not a licensing rule, but a payment rule that said, even though Medicare typically would also require that the provider be licensed in the state where the patient is located or follow state licensing rules, that for Medicare payment purposes, um, the provider could be paid for a telehealth service um, regardless of where the patient was located. So that really was just to open up the door for payment rules so that once the states created their emergency declarations, that allowed their state agencies to create flexibilities. And those agencies created flexibilities allowing providers to see patients across state lines. Medicare said they would pay for that. So most of the states at Kansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma that we have here, their state de emergency declarations have ended. So those flexibilities to, be, to see patients um, within other within the state where the patient's located and not be licensed in that state have really gone away. Um, but there are interstate licensing compacts. Kansas has an expedited licensing process if you're just getting licensed as a telemedicine provider within the state of Kansas um, that providers can utilize. But the big picture answer to that is by and large, yes, the provider needs to be licensed in the state where the patient is, is located unless they're part of a, an interstate licensing compact, but they do need to be following that state's um, licensing laws for their particular profession. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so now we're going to move into the case. As I mentioned earlier, which Rochelle will, will be presenting a case to demonstrate how a long-term care facility transformed, transformed services to build a sustainable telehealth model. 
In this case, the facility was focused on mental and behavioral health. The facility has been de-identified and agreed to share their story. All right, thank you for the introduction. So this is, um, I think, such a fascinating way that this, this group of providers that works with long-term care communities to um, deliver the specialized services of psychiatric and behavioral and mental health care that maybe the long-term community doesn't directly have access to or expertise within their facility or their medical director, the providers that come in to handle um, the, the more common medical issues don't have necessarily within their area of expertise. So that's what this provider group did pre-COVID. Um, and they did some really interesting things as these flexibilities came about to make sure they were able to continue to provide care and services and access to their specialized care despite some of the unique nuances that came about during COVID and do so in a way that set them up for success um, even when the PHE eventually ends, knock on wood. So let me tell you a little bit about this provider group. Um, it's a group of professionals that would contract with long-term care communities. And the long-term care communities recognize that they're getting paid by Medicare and Medicaid you know, to holistically take care of the patients, but maybe didn't have access or, or expertise to the psychiatric, mental, behavioral, healthcare component that they could really do a better job taking care of their patients if they had access to that expertise. And incomes, uh, this particular provider group, and they focus on long-term care and working with those individuals in long-term care. So they're contracted with these facilities, but um, they're not employees of the long-term care community. Um, they've got their everything from licensed clinical social workers to registered nurses, to um, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, all along the spectrum of mental and behavioral health providers available. So I wanna look at their pre-COVID model. Um, prior to COVID, their services were generally directly in-person face-to-face. So they would have that social worker or registered nurse or psychologist or um, uh, psychiatrist, excuse me, go on site to the communities and patients who were needing um, evaluations or needing follow-up for mental behavioral health conditions at that time could meet with the providers. The providers would have interdisciplinary team meetings physically in person on site at those different communities. Um, so there's certainly some advantages to that. The drawbacks, of course, it were that requires travel to the various communities they serve, which reduces the amount of time that they had available to actually see and help take care of patients. Because of the pre-COVID rules surrounding the delivery of telehealth, in the instances that they could have delivered telehealth, they were limited to only being able to see patients via telehealth if the facility was located in a rural geographic area. So their um, communities in kind of a metropolitan area didn't even have that, that ability to be seen um, virtually. Um, the staff, in, in the instance that they did have a virtual visit, the staff at the facility would present the patient for the service. So that's the idea of the originating site. They may have a nurse, you know, presenting or in the room to present the patient to the distant site, social worker, psychologist, or psychiatrist. Early on in the transition to um, COVID, when we had um, a lot of these flexibilities starting to roll out, um, remember, long-term care was uh, a really risky side of service, and a lot of those communities were completely on lockdown, including in many instances to healthcare providers like this group that physically were not able to go into the communities because of the lockdown um, and uh, prohibition on visitors and other healthcare providers coming into the facility unless it was absolutely necessary. So that really put um, these mental behavioral health providers and the patients um, at the mercy of each facility's policy on what they were allowing and what they were not allowing in terms of outside um, individuals. Uh, and remember, this is probably, I don't remember the timeline on when COVID tests were available, um, certainly before vaccinations were available, but um, 
uh, at least at the very beginning and the height of the COVID public health emergency, that was a real issue in accessing patients in the communities. Um, the, the clinicians themselves, even if they could go to the facility, they were reluctant to do so because there were a lot of outbreaks of COVID-19 in that sort of confined area that if, if someone were to get COVID in a long-term care facility, it tended to spread um, rapidly and they were reluctant to have in-person visits in those high-risk settings also. Um, also at the time, um, presenting patients via telehealth created an additional challenge and, and still does because of staffing levels and just the logistics of having someone available for um, bringing the patient to a, a setting where a telehealth service could be delivered. So access to patients and continuity of care and quality of care were really strained as they were, I'm sure, um, all across the country in care sites, but particularly for these specialized services during that time. So they did some really cool things to adapt to those constraints and utilize the telehealth flexibilities that were available to them. Um, they, they first were looking at um, different reimbursement options in the behavioral health space, including telehealth, that were already available. Um, so some things that they did, even outside of just true traditional telehealth, were look at other mechanisms like um, psychiatric collaborative care, transitional care management, behavioral health integration. These are models and services that had already been created and covered by Medicare that were really designed to help manage patients um, in a non-face-to-face -face way. Psychiatric collaborative care typically involves working with like a psychiatrist or even a pharmacist to help manage the um, mental behavioral psychiatric medication component of the patient's holistic medical care picture. Behavioral health integration was a way to get um, social workers or psychologists involved in the interdisciplinary um, team involving the patient's condition. So they kind of took a step back and said, what, what is out there? If we can't physically go into these facilities to see our patients, what can we do in terms of the at least the exchange of information to be able to continue to take care of them and make sure their needs are met? Um, so you know, behavioral health integration, psychiatric collaborative care, they were more involved in interdisciplinary team conferences, um, which they could do virtually. That piece didn't have a restriction um, that the actual telehealth service did. So they could still be involved in those meetings at the long-term care community. They also created um, a role where they have a, a social called a, a facility social worker liaison. So they would have their own provider once the facilities kind of opened up a little bit, um, a social worker who could go into the facility and present the patient. And that really helped alleviate the staffing burden on the facilities and their reluctance to um, engage this provider group because they just didn't have the resources to, to have a nurse go in and present the patient. So this provider group sent their own social worker um, to the facility to help present the patient for a telehealth service. The on-site staff then, um, like the, the facility social worker, were really helping um, be the on-site eyes and ears to communicate observations and things to the distant site provider during the telehealth services. So what they found as a result of using um, some of these um, alternative care models, telehealth and utilizing the flexibilities they had, creating the social worker and um, stepping back and, and when they were really restricted in any way for go from going into the facility or doing telehealth uh, to take advantage of non-face-to-face non-telehealth services like care integration and care management, um, they saw some really cool outcomes that, that they didn't necessarily expect. Um, they were noticing decreased wait times for their visit, meaning a patient who needed a psychiatric evaluation or needed an, an initial consult with a mental or behavioral health care provider, they could do it much quicker because they weren't sending those providers physically out to each location. Instead, that time could be used to get more patients in during a day and get their evaluations and coordinate with their on-site care team. 
they actually found that by doing telehealth and by being able to be part of the interdisciplinary team, sometimes virtually, um, that they were actually doing a better job coordinating care than when they were on site. Because when they were on site, it may not necessarily be the days and times that the interdisciplinary team was meeting or other important providers may not be there at the same time, but this let them do that all virtually and there was actually better communication, better outcomes, better coordination um, as a result of their, their move to these virtual care services. Patients were happier. They liked being able to have the visit from the comfort of their room. They liked the privacy of that. They liked the quick access. Um, uh, having the on-site social worker helped alleviate any technological um, challenges that the, the residents of those long-term long communities may otherwise have had. Um, and um, just generally noticed that patients were doing better having that person to talk to when they needed them. Taking the step back to see what other Medicare services are already out there, despite the telehealth flexibilities during the PHE, like psychiatric collaborative care, behavioral health integration, chronic care management, um, and, and those types of services, they were creating a model that, allow, that will allow them financial stability and sustainability after the PHE ends. So when when and if some of these flexibilities like rural geographic area restrictions going away, if that comes back after the PHE, they they've got a they've got a response to that. They've got a plan for how they can continue to take care of the patient's conditions um, for psychiatric mental and behavioral health without necessarily relying on those flexibilities um, to continue. So both financially and just their care delivery model enables them um, to continue this, not only after the PHE, but when those flexibilities end. So moving forward, I wanna kind of take that case study and how that can translate outside of this particular provider and what they've done before, during, and, and what they will be doing after the PHE and um, give kind of some tips and suggestions for you all on what that might look like um, as the PHE, again, knock on wood, if you've got it, eventually winds down. Um, one of the, I guess, the bigger picture suggestions that I would have is to do what this provider group did in realizing what flexibilities that we have grown so accustomed to now for two and a half years that feel permanent, but they're not. What are we relying on that could go away? And if it could go away, what are, what's our response going to be if that flexibility is no longer available? I'm hopeful by, I'm hopeful this um, bill that has passed the House will pass the Senate. I'm hopeful that that would mean those flexibilities get extended through December 31st of 2024. And I'm hopeful that that would mean Congress has time to address the concerns that they had that prevented them from making these changes permanent right now, address those concerns and make these flexibilities permit. But that's three levels of hopeful that would have to happen in two years to make that permanent. So, um, you know, we can hope, but we, we need to be prepared for the alternative. So moving forward, a couple of things that you can do is evaluate your, your current services and what Medicare programs, codes, um, services, benefit categories are already there that describe things that you're already doing. Um, I've also found in a group like, like this behavioral health care provider, they may have been doing some things already and doing the work and pretty much documenting the work for services that could be separately coded and billed, but they didn't realize it's a separately billable service. Um, for example, advanced care planning, depression screening, alcohol or substance abuse screening. Those are things that are already available that could be options. If you're doing it, we wanna make sure we're capturing um, the work to provide those services already. And many of those can also be done in a telehealth or in a virtual format. 
virtual check-ins, um, something that it's not a telehealth service. It's not under the telehealth benefit category of Medicare but it's a type of virtual service that you can check in to see if a patient needs to present in person for a visit. And it could potentially be separately reportable under certain circumstances. Care management, chronic care management, transitional care management. Care management is a prime area that if you're dealing with chronic conditions with patients, there may be a lot of options for you outside of um, telehealth, the traditional telehealth definition and benefit category, yet they're virtual, they're non-face-to-face -face type services that you could look at to um, continue to provide that care that you may already be doing in a sustainable way after the public health emergency ends. I think it's important to um, think about what changes you have made during the PHU with respect to telehealth. And of those changes, which ones are relying on flexibilities versus which ones are just based on starting to do more telehealth um, um, despite the flexibilities, but, but we would have the ability to continue those services even if the flexibilities go away. But we need to understand which flexibilities we're relying upon and kind of keep track of whether those flexibilities are likely to stay or not. An example of that may be if you are a um, rural health clinic or a federally qualified health center that as a result of the PHE, you've begun to deliver telehealth as a distant site provider. Um, as I look at all of the federal bills that have been advanced, there are many, many of them with respect to telehealth. A common thread is that most of them want FQHCs and RHCs to continue to be able to deliver telehealth as distant site providers permanently. That's a trend. So I see at some point in the future, a likelihood that that may continue. On the other hand, we know that um, under the, the legislation that was passed earlier this year, critical access hospitals were not included in that list. So that's an example of thinking about um, the likelihood of flexibilities continuing when the PHE winds down that we would wanna take into consideration. And my gosh, this next one's a big task. Um, as much as workflows, operations, change during the ramp up of telehealth at the beginning of the public health emergency, a lot of that may have to be walked back and reversed at the end of this. Um, so I think it's a good time to take a look at some of those. If you're in Missouri, um, the Missouri um, a Missouri Hospital Association had a really get great tracker on their website that was an Excel spreadsheet and it had tabs for dis different disciplines of providers Remember when we had the emergency declaration and all of these executive orders and then all of these agency waivers of rules and regulations, it was a great tool to go see what changed. And if you're in Missouri, um, Kansas, uh, uh, Oklahoma, we can you can look at your um, state hospital associations or similar resources, but that's a good way to track and see, okay, what have we changed um, as a result of, of these different flexibilities that we may need to eventually walk back? And of course, keeping an eye on legislation. Groups like this will be a great one to stay apprised of the PHU renewals, um, state policies changing. We had a lot of that going on at the beginning of the year in Missouri, where there was some uncertainty on telehealth and how it was going to work. Licensing laws, that, that question that we had a, um, uh, some comment in the box, that's going to be one to watch also. I think a lot of states are looking at how they license providers in other states, having limited license for telehealth. So um, staying apprised of what changes and what options we have there are going to be important also. And so I'll um, pause there. And Molly, if we have any questions in the comments or discussion, I would uh, open the mic. So just to um, summarize, as um, um, to kind of wrap up our case, this we had a long-term care facility that needed to continue to provide behavioral health services during a time that for facilities had to be locked down essentially during the public health emergency. They provided expanded services to fill gaps that were not otherwise provided related to behavioral health. And uh, at the time, their appointments were mostly face-to-face, -face, their visits were mostly face-to-face, -face, and telehealth at the time was limited to rural health areas. They adapted by enhancing 
Medicare reimbursement options. They uh, changed some of their um, workflows. They created options for the group to adapt to care different care models and then created um, a facility social worker liaison to help reduce barriers to treatment. On-site on staff also helped with the, to facilitate the visits. We have um, about five minutes to maybe work through just to any clarifying recommendations that Rochelle had. Do any participants have any um, clarifying questions for Rochelle? All right, I'm not hearing or seeing anything from the hub team to either contribute or um, maybe. I did have a question. Um, I just kind of, um, I think I was a, a few minutes late coming on board. And so when we were going over the public health um, emergency dates um, for what's been renewed, um, can is that for all states or which states was that applicable to? Yes, thank you for that question. And it, it is a it was a very complicated web of different emergency declarations because we had the federal public health emergency that allowed federal agencies um, certain flexibilities during the emergency. That's the one that's been renewed. So that's the one that allows us to continue to provide um, Medicare telehealth services, relying on these these flexibilities in telehealth to Medicare beneficiaries until the point when the PHE ends and, and in some instances for at least 151 days after. Um, Missouri, Kansas, and Oklahoma's state emergency declarations have all expired. Thank you. And with that, Rochelle, we did have um, a, a comment and question in the chat earlier about a little bit more clarification to where to find that PDF file that you mentioned as part of CMS. Um, I think there was a couple resources mentioned. I did drop some in the chat box from your slide presentation, but I think there were a couple more that you mentioned um, that we could help a little okay, bit. And I that. think I'm looking at that comment. That was uh, Jennifer. Is that referring to the list of covered telehealth services? If yeah, you said there was a um, a list that said what what was going to go away, what would be audio only, things like that. Yeah, help me. All right, I, I am happy to walk through that. Yes, can everybody see? You can see the screen, my browser. Okay, perfect. So, um, I'm on just on CMS.gov, and I'm sure there's a hundred ways to get here. But if you click on Medicare here, I'm going to scroll down to the bottom. They have provider types. I'm going to click on physician because uh, it's not limited to physician in the sense of MD and DO, but it's under the Medicare physician fee schedule. So that's why I'm clicking on physician there. And if we scroll down to medic, um, excuse me, physician fee schedule, and then PFS, that's physician fee schedule, federal regulation notices. Um, you could go to the 2022 final, the F means final, the P means proposed. So if you want to look at what we have in place right now, you could pull up the 2022 final. If you want to look and see what's, um, what is proposed that we should have a finalized rule on in the next three weeks. That'll be the breaking news at our next session, probably. You can click there and you're going to scroll down. This is the actual proposed rule document from the Federal Register. And then all of these attachments go with it. And there's a list of telehealth services. Okay, so we've got um, the codes that are covered as telehealth services. Short description, their status. So if it's blank, that's a service that's co uh, permanently covered as a telehealth service. So if we go to like office visits, for example, permanently covered, or um, there, if I filter that, things that are, are services that are only available through the end of next year, you can see um, those that would end the day the PHE ends are these categories. And then column D shows you if they're eligible for audio only. If it doesn't say yes, I mean, it's a, it's a well, growing list, I guess, but if that's blank, 
then you have to have audio visual telecommunications technology to render that particular service. And Medicaid may be different than Medicare, right? Because as that's I exactly right. Medicaid says yes, it has to be AV, where Medicare may say it can be audio only. That's exact. I mean, that's a great that's a great point. And even commercial payer policies can be different from Medicare and can be different from Medicaid. Um, Missouri, for example, um, the Medicaid program allows any service that can be rendered in person could be delivered as a telehealth service. There's payment parity. So every state's Medicaid program can have their own policies on this as well. Thank you for walking us through that, Rochelle. I think that's very helpful. Um, we have just a few minutes left. Was there any other comments related to recommendations or any ideas for the um, case study that was presented? I will quickly remind everyone, um, they evaluated their current coding and billing options. Evaluation can be very valuable in your clinical setting anyway, just to see how things are, are flowing, especially as you start uh, accessing resources to find out what's going to happen after the PHE ends. Understanding what changes you've made during the PHE and then what changes were based on flexibilities versus those that were based on existing telehealth rules. So having a, that second plan in place for those changes that might occur um, if a flexibility does go away and it's not um, made into a permanent uh, solution. Look at your workflows. Um, what would you need to change if those flexibilities end? And then keep an eye on legislation. With that, I did put, we have a national partner, the Center for Connected Health Policy. I put their website in the chat because they also keep uh, national federal level updates with legislation. And also you can, you can toggle through into your own state and you can take a look at, at um, what's happening in the state. And they do a, they do a good job keeping that updated. We, we turn to them off and we are national partners with them. And then Joe also put the previous Show Me Echo Telemed sessions in the chat as well. So if you want to see what we were up to last year, the last cycle, then you can go check out those topics. Um, I don't know if there's anything else uh, that we need to go over. Again, you can reach out to us at um, htrc at kumc.edu for the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center. And then also um, um, contact the Show Me Echo team if you have any questions specific to the Echo. In November, on November 15th, on Tuesday, it's the third Tuesday of the month from 12 to 1, our next session will be integrating telehealth into routine care. And so please check us out and get registered for that. Keep that on your calendar. You will see updates from us regarding that time. And if you have any additional questions, you can reach out to us. Um, our uh, the HTRC email is in the chat as well along with uh, Show Me Echo. I think that's all we have. Thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of your week.